Um, my name's Andrew White. I direct the Center for New York City Affairs here at the New School, which is part of Milano, the Milano School for International Affairs, Management, and Urban Policy. And the event is um, co-sponsored between the Center and the Education and Learning Working Group at the New School, which is a committee of people from across all the divisions of the university that are looking into the strategies to create uh, sort of a hub around public education um, teaching and learning and research here at the New School. At the center, we do a great deal of research around education policy in New York City, particularly as it affects low-income families and their neighborhoods. And we also publish InsideSchools.org, which I hope all of you are familiar with. And if you're not, please go there and check it out. Um, we've been working for a long time to try to change the conversation around education reform and to move people away from the idea that there are these silver bullet solutions to be found in charter schools and high stakes testing and school choice and teacher accountability metrics. And, you know, that said, all of our, all this work we've been doing, it's in a context of New York City where, in fact, a lot of positive changes have happened over the last, you know, 12 years or so. But most of the improvements as we see it have come through a lot of other things going on, not just the sort of silver bullet solutions including a lot more money, but also professional development and teacher teaching and learning um, strategies and tighter supervision and so on. Um, anyone who's ever worked in a city school or done research in city schools knows that schools don't become excellent just by doing intensive test prep. And there are, you know, there are many other factors to be attended to. And picking up David Kerb's book, you can't help but see the, the broad swath of all of many of those different um, tasks and strategies and factors at work. Um, this evening we're going to hear from our main speaker. We're also going to have a conversation uh, with Clara Hempel and Natalia, um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on, on Nat Natalia Malman Pedrezela, who is a professor at Lang. And um, then we will involve you all as well, I hope. First, I want to invite to the stage Dean Neil Graboy of the Milano School. Neil. Thank you very much, Andrew. And I'd like to uh, add my words of welcome to all of you. This is really uh, a packed house, and it's a packed house for, for good reason. Uh, K through 12 education isn't doing very well in the United States, despite many experiments. Important research has established uh, pretty definitively that at those moments when the United States was ahead of other countries in elementary education, uh, we were technologically and economically ahead of other countries as well. When we were ahead in high school education, the same thing was the case. When we were ahead in university education, the same thing was the, ca was the case. And now other countries are moving forward in ways that I th fear uh, are not, uh, not going to help us at all. Uh, it's evident, especially in New York City, that we know how to create individual schools that are really pretty terrific. And we've had all these examination schools, but lots of non-examination schools as well. We can create an excellent school one at a time, but we're not very sure on how to create excellent schools a district at a time, never mind a city at a time. We have pretty clear principles for what it takes to produce excellent teachers. Training grounded in evidence, commitment to content knowledge, viewing teaching as a clinical practice profession, sharing data, among other things. Despite what we think we have, however, many nations seem to be surpassing the United States in education quality, and we need to only look at all these various uh, ways of assessing, some of which we worry about, but nevertheless, there are some here that don't do very much assessing at all, like Finland, where you start elementary school at age seven, there's no national exams of any kind, and education is uh, rather, rather powerful. South Korea is fantastic in elementary education. They pay elementary school teachers much more than they pay high school teachers. They really take elementary education seriously. And Hungary, if you're looking at math, 
uh, computer science, uh, stuff that you have to really understand Hungarian to be able to do effectively, they do rather a spectacular idea, you know, a spectacular, a spectacular good things. Uh, other na nations seem to be moving backward. There are some interesting developments in the university system in Great Britain now, end of tenure, lots of other things uh, regarding research funds that are probably unraveling uh, slowly, but it'll gain speed, what's happening in higher education in Great Britain. But for us, the wealth divide is too often correlated with the education divide. Certain claims about accountability and a kind of fallacy of misplaced quantification, like Nickleby, no child left behind in Chris Edley's uh, pronunciation, and perhaps race to the top haven't yet made palpable differences. Sadly, uh, Yogi Berra has it right. If you don't know where you're going, you'll probably get someplace different. We're very fortunate to have with us this evening David Kerp, professor at the Goldman School of Public Policy at Berkeley, a polymath, a graduate of Amherst and someplace called Harvard Law School, uh, passionate about children's issues, author of some 15 books, many articles. Three of my favorites were uh, keep in keeping with my general attitude toward schadenfreude. Uh, Paul Ryan Hates Co Kids, Is Michelle Rhee a 16th century, century Throwback? And Kids Last. Uh, all I'm sure, maybe I shouldn't be sure, tongue in cheek, uh, but who knows uh, what we should be doing. Uh, Professor Kerp understands what's been happening to education in America and what can be done to turn it around. Now that some jurisdictions are prepared to provide financial support to families to send their children to any school they please, Professor Kerb's knowledge, insights, and passion are increasingly vital, especially to help save the public school system. So please uh, join me in welcoming David Kerb uh, to uh, the New School. So I will say that when I was invited to give a talk by the S Center for New York, City. New York City Affairs. I wondered what, was, what that might entail. Um, it's going to be a more risque event than I, than, I, than I anticipated, but I guess affairs mean something, mean something else. Just a, <laughs> I'm sure you've heard that before, Andy. Um, I needn't tell anybody here that this is a contentious moment in a history of contentious moments in education. Um, just about three weeks ago, there was a school board election in Los Angeles. Um, and $4 million was spent to defeat one candidate in that election. Um, that candidate's sins were to question the untrammeled growth of charter schools and to raise questions about just how much of teacher evaluation should rest on um, so-called value-added test score increases. Um, one million of those four million dollars was invested by a guy named Michael Bloomberg. Um, and it occurred to me, since he's turned out here, maybe he wants to move cross-country and start all over again, pick up stakes and go to LA and run the place. Half a million from Rupert Murdoch, quarter of a million dollars from my favorite educator, Michelle Rhee, that 16th century throwback to Neil mentioned. Um, the other side, the teachers union came up with a million dollars. Um, so still outspent four to one. Um, that candidate actually managed to, to win. Um, interestingly though, if you read the press put out by the Michelle Rhee and other folks, they claim a great victory because one of the candidates they backed to the tune of several million dollars beat somebody else who had a total of $16,000 in the bank account. Kind of hard to run that sort of race these days. And closer to home, uh, and I'm aware, every time I come here, I'm aware of how right that Saul Steinberg cartoon is about New Yorkers' view of the, of the universe, right? Is this, is the, this is the mayoral election race. And when I mentioned to Billy Easton, who's sitting here, community organizer extraordinaire, here was this really interesting stuff that I was doing. Union City, what it has to teach America. He said, America, America, talk about what Union City has to teach New York City. And so there's a daily news piece. Um, that um, was published last, um, last week, which I'm sure puts me on the mayor's enemies um, list. But we are at a, at a moment when, in lots of quarters, the 
and quarters that interestingly have seized the phrase reformers as their own, uh, the public schools are, are seen as being irretrievably broken. The only real answer being charters or vouchers, depending on where you are. I don't know how many of you saw the piece in the New York Times the other day about the increasing number of states that are moving toward vouchers. And if you want to get a truly horrific sense of what America's education future could look like, I write about the Louisiana voucher scheme um, here where there's literally a voucher school in, in which the kids have to pledge their allegiance to the head of the school as the, the true apostle of Christ. Um, and then with state dollars, they get to go to school there. Um, so in the midst of all that, um, I found myself um, through a, an interesting set of circumstances across the river um, in Union City, um, which is about four miles from here and several light years in terms of the style of place it is, um, and spent a wonderful year there. Um, I, was, uh, I hung out a fair amount of the time in a third grade class where I was Mr. David to a bunch of uh, immigrant kids who were learning English and about to take the first big high stakes test. Um, spent time in, the, in that school, in, the, in other schools. I really had a passport to roam around any place I wanted from the mayor's office to you know, the, 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 the classroom. Um, and what I found there tells me that indeed it, the reinvention or the reinvigoration better of public schools is indeed possible. And while I wouldn't ever, people have said to me, and I was, teach, when I was talking at Teachers College, they said, but what can you do for it in New York City? I said, I have no idea. It's much too big for me to think about. But districts, as you were, you know, districts, that's a much more manageable unit to, uh, to think about. And I think Union City and other successful places, very much under the radar, um, have very useful things to say about how, in fact, to rebuild a system. And if you want the short, short answer to what I have to say, it is slowly, patiently, system building with a model premised on trust and not on intimidation, on high expectations, but not draconian consequences. Um, I don't know how many of you have been over to Union City. It's actually, it's a wonderful town. You haven't, I'd suggest that you get on any Port Authority bus and basically first stop will get you there. It's a very lively Latino community, but it's an unlikely poster child for education reform. It's one of the seven or 80 poorest cities in the country. It's one of the most crowded cities in the country. It's the sort of place where you have immigrant families living three and four families in an apartment house behind a locked bedroom door sharing a, a refrigerator. Um, Maybe a third of the families are, are undocumented, and so they're living in constant fear that, that ICE will show up at the, at the door. And if we turn the clock back a quarter century ago, the schools in Union City were so terrible, so derelict, that the state threatened to take them over. Indeed, they were, they were second worst in the state, bested, if that's the right word, only by Camden, and so people in the mordant cry in Union City was, thank God for Camden. And if you followed, you know, that was then, this is now, the Camden schools have just been taken over by the, by the, state, of, uh, the state of New Jersey. So what happened in Union City was the opposite of a quick fix or a miracle cure. It was the gradual building and solidifying of a set of proven game-changing strategies from preschool through high school. Um, there's nothing, the, the news is that there's nothing new going on there. There isn't an educator with a pulse who isn't familiar with these ways of building a school system. The trick is actually to do it, to stick with it. And here's why you ought to be paying attention to Union City. Um, it's students are performing at or above um, New Jersey state average on the reading and math tests from third grade on. Um, and more impressively, um, the high school graduation rate is 90%. So those of you who know the New York figures, we're, we're, you know, that's about 25% higher than New York. It's about 15% higher than the national average. Uh, and remember, we're talking about poor Latino 
immigrant kids, the rate here of graduation here for those kids is something under 50%. So, um, and 75% of those kids enroll in college. And as I said, this isn't, it's a great story, but it's also a lesson that other places can learn from. It really is a tortoise and hare story, a slow and steady wins the race tale. And, you know, at the risk of grossly oversimplifying, let me tell you the kind of essence of what Union City did. It's all sitting in the book, and the books are sitting right back there, so don't scribble down or anything. <laughs> High quality full day preschool for all kids starts at age three. The classrooms emphasize reading and, and writing. They recognize that these are kids who don't come from homes where parents have time or opportunity or maybe even the education to be reading to their youngsters. So there's lots of language from very early on. Um, immigrant kids become fluent as speakers, readers, and writers first in Spanish before moving on to English so they develop that foundation in their native language and they do it gradually. It's not here we are in Spanish one day, we are in English the next day. It's a very granulated system. The curriculum is a challenging curriculum. It's one that's much more problem oriented than parroting and character. It's largely developed by teachers, the sort of star teachers in the school system who work during summers to, to moderate the, the curriculum. Um, it's the same from school to school across the district. Why? Because poor kids move. Poor families move a lot within school districts during the course of a year. So if a kid isn't going to get lost, you know, when you go to another school, you can pick up where you, where you left off. And the curriculum is coordinated from one year to the next so that you're not going to, you know, read Old Man in the Sea two or three years running. You really are going to get a progression of, of increasingly rich and difficult and challenging things to be doing. Um, the students are assessed frequently um, and the analyses are really, I think the really fine-grained analysis, not just total scores, but did this kid or did this group of kids do, do well or badly in word problems in math, for example, or comprehension of uh, nonfiction writing and what can we do to help that group of kids or that individual kid with a set of problems. And you can use those scores as well to figure out how the teachers are doing in a whole variety of ways. How are they doing this year as compared to last year? How are they doing as compared to their peers? How are they doing with kids who've been around the system for five years as opposed to newcomers? How are they doing with word problems as opposed to computation problems? It's, it's an amazing amount of data and the the reformers would salivate at the chance to use it to beat up on teachers. There it really is used to target the kind of help that teachers need. And they get it in all sorts of ways. Uh, teachers too often live isolated in their own classrooms, the kind of you know, Queen Victoria effect I sort of describe it as. There you've got time set aside to collaborate you know, across grade levels and in high school across you know, subject areas, so the chemistry teachers or the third grade teachers are working together. The very good experienced teachers in a school will spend some time working in the classroom with a peer who's struggling. They'll bring in coaches to work alongside teachers, kind of, you know, watch one, do one, teach one method brought into the, into the school. And I should say, that there's nothing fancy about these teachers. There's not a single Teach for America teacher in the system. They're all locals. Almost all of them are locals. By which I mean they grew up and went to school and came back and stayed within 50 miles of Union City. You know, Rutgers would have been the stretch school for most of them. So they went to what was called Jersey City College and now I think has the fancier name of North Jersey State or Fairley Dickinson or St. Peter's or, and they came back. Um, and that's typical, by the way, of America, that people stay in their communities. And it's an important asset that the school district can call on because they really do think of the students as their kids. They're not parachuting in on a rescue mission. This is their community, um, their kids. Um, the school district has invested a lot of time and energy in reaching out to parents. Um, it 
not only in, it, it enlists them as partners in their kids' education, but it also provides them with real concrete support. Every school has a community liaison who is someone who actually comes from the neighborhood and knows everybody in the neighborhood. You know, and so when a kid is absent one day or comes in late a couple of times, Maria Canick in Washington School where I hung out would be on the phone to the parents saying what's going on with Maria or Joaquin. Um, and if the parents can't afford the school uniform or are having a hard time getting in the public housing roles or you know, doing the paperwork they need to do to, to move on the route to a road toward a green card, those liaisons are there to help. I, and I had a sense both of the reality of the parent engagement and the power of it when I, month after being in the, <coughs> excuse me, in the school, I went to a parents' night meeting. Um, now, those of you who know about urban schools will know that these are usually very sparsely attended events. If you get 10 or 15% of the parents, you're lucky. And it was pouring out, the kind of weather that would destroy any umbrella. So people were going to be soaked. I thought nobody is going to show up. They filled the auditorium. I'm guessing that 80 or 90% of the kids had a mom or a dad or an aunt or a grandma or a family friend or somebody there and that that person would then go into the classroom. And I sat in on some of those conversations with a third grade teacher who I was hanging out with. Um, and she would say to the parents, um, by the way, this was all conducted both in Spanish and in, and in English. Um, there are a handful of parents who didn't speak Spanish, and that's why you conduct this in both Spanish and English, to make everybody feel at home. And the, the teacher would say to these parents, you know, yes, you do have something to contribute to your kid's education. You can check on whether the homework is getting done. When you go to the story, you can take her with you. You can, you can sit with her while she's reading if you're going on the bus to work. And for these parents, many of them recent immigrants, many of them themselves with very limited education. This is the first time anybody ever told them that they had anything useful to contribute to their kids' education. And I could watch, you know, what happened to them as they just, you know, imbibe that incredible message. Um, and it's, it's a school system that manages to combine high expectations. I mean, this is a district whose reputation, for better and for worse, rests on those test scores that are the coin of the realm these days, and those graduation rates, which to me are much more important. And that's something that they care about and focus on, and if there's a problem that arises, there's going to be an attempt to figure out why and what to do to, to help. But it's also a school, I, when I write about this, I use two um, Spanish words because I really couldn't, the translations didn't really work as well for me. It's a culture of abrazos. It's a culture of hugs, of warmth, I mean literally of, of embraces that you feel wherever you are in that, in that school system. And there is across every line, student to teacher, teacher to administrator, principal to superintendent and other folks in the central office, community and parents to schools, there is a sense of respect, though, of respect um, that is pervasive. And those things, trust, respect, warmth, you know, are essential ingredients. They don't, and they don't just happen. So I guess what I would say, that's a list, right, which I've elaborated on a bit. And the danger of a list like that is people say, aha, I'm going to take that and go away and do it. It's very easy to say. It's really, really hard to do. Um, and the devil is in the details and getting it right and the realization that you're never done that the process keeps going on, that there are always issues to be addressed. Sometimes old issues resurfacing, sometimes new challenges that arise. But there's no mission accomplished um, kind of uh, victory claims that anybody is, um, anybody is making in that, in that um, system. So let me just tell you a little bit about some of the programs that I thought were pretty special. Let's start with, a, with, with preschool. You know, for many educators, preschool is the afterthought. I'm glad to hear Neil talk about the fact that the Koreans pay elementary school teachers more than high school teachers. They should be paying preschool teachers more yet. If you, if you haven't seen a great preschool teacher in action, you owe it to yourself to spend a morning doing so. It's going to be exhilarating, uplifting, and exhausting because 
you don't get to observe. I mean, three and four year olds don't get observer, right? So if you're hanging out there, you're going to get, you're going to become part of the action. I would spend mornings in this Susie Rojas's class, and I'd wonder how the heck she did it. And I was the observer, not the, not the teacher. You walk into her classroom, and it really feels like a garden of delights. It makes you think, gee, why am I not four years old? It would be so much fun to do this. And every one of her lessons is just full of these astonishing moments. University professors think about teachable moments, right? Those occasions when the light bulb goes off. There are teachable moments every 10 minutes in a preschool class. Um, and it's astonishing to watch. I actually want to read, which I haven't done before, a little bit um, from one of the lessons. Um, so, this is, a, this is a story, well, you'll hear. In a mid-December morning, the topic is latkes, the potato pancakes that are a Hanukkah staple. It's not exactly what you might anticipate in a room filled with Latino children, few if any of whom have ever met a Jew in their lives, and all the more engaging for that reason. These kids have been listening to the Hanukkah guest, the beguiling tale of 97-year-old, nearly blind, Bubba Brena, the best latke maker in her village, who cooks a batch of them for the Rebbe and inadvertently feeds them to a grumpy old bear. Now they're going to make latkes from scratch. Everything that transpires during the next 90 minutes could be called a teachable moment. Describing the smell of an onion, strong or light, strong, duro. Will it smell differently when we cook it? We'll have to find out. Pronouncing the peas and pepper and pimiento, getting the hang of a food processor. When I put all the ingredients in, what will happen? All of us participated in getting to the fact that the chopper is actually going to chop the food. And I remember at one point, um, one of the kids dropped a potato on the ground and Susie picked up the potato and said, this is what cooks do. You know, they wipe it off and then they go back to cooking. Don't worry. Um, so I loved it. I came back. The children served those potato pancakes, um, which were really good, with sour cream and applesauce. And being Latino kids, um, with um, salsa as well. It's a great combination. Let me tell you, I, I've, I've decided that salsa is better than applesauce with potatoes. Think about it. Um, so I could tell you similar stories from, from each of the schools. I mean, a minute about the classroom in which I spent a lot of time, Alina Basbali's class, and this group of third graders. And I spent a lot of time in the book grounding the story there, because even as I wander off to Washington and Trenton and the political system, I'm sort of coming back to this, to this place. So on, on her first day, she's focusing on character building. She never uses the phrase character education. This is kind of what the classroom is about. She describes herself as dulce y duro, sweet and tough. And indeed she is. And she has two little prizes kind of things that she wants to show the kids. There is the magic box and the, the, the jar with glass, mar with the, the marbles jar. And the magic box is for a kid who does something wonderful during the course of the day. She can go up and take something from the magic box. So that's kind of rewarding great individual effort. The jar is when the class as a whole does something. And then you put a marble in the jar. When the jar is full, then the kids get to decide what the special treat is going to be. Usually it is pizza and ice cream. And we had long, politically correct conversations about why overweight Latino little kids should be eating pizza and ice cream, but I finally gave up on, on, uh, on, on that. Um, she, the metaphor that she used to describe what the class was about, and over and over again she would use it, is el pai. Now, those of you who speak Spanish will cringe, right? The, the, the word is pastel. But never mind, we're in Spanglish world here, and so it's el pie, the pie, right? Everybody, the class is the pie, and everybody is a piece of the pie, and the pieces are different, so there's the pepperoni and the mushroom and the whatever else in the pie. But we're all together in this venture. That's one theme. And another, which I loved, was the mind is a powerful thing. Discipline comes from within. We're talking to eight-year-olds, right? We're, we're telling eight-year-olds they're Kantian 
agents, right? That's basically, you know, you get to, right, you get to make crucial decisions in your life. And that message would come up over and over again in particular context of the, uh, of the class. So there are a host of stories, some of which are in the book, some of which couldn't make it into the book, of teachers so good that I only wish that, you know, you could get a TV camera in there and record them for, for posterity. Um, individual teachers and even individual grades and individual schools, you know, they're astonishing things. And this is what Neil had mentioned before. Um, the teachers become solidified because they're working together. And the third grade teachers were known in the school system as the dream team, not only because the results were great, but because they were so connected to each other, in and out of each other's rooms all the time, sharing, contributing, you know, noodling about new ideas that would go on. And when they went out to lunch, and I would join them for lunch from time to time, there'd be a little bit of conversation about, you know, the sale that's going on down the street and the movie they just saw or the meal they just had, but a lot of conversation about the kids. Lots of conversation about the kids. The school itself was, in a very real sense, a community. And the, the culture would vary some, depending upon who the principal was. But what struck me most is, is the high school there, which is a truly astonishing school. I mean, if you know, the high school and the preschool are truly national exemplars. Forget good urban school. Forget good inner city school. Just think good school. Um, and there, the principal, a guy named John Benetti, has managed to make out of a 2,400 student school a real, honest to God, functioning community in which he is deeply engaged academically and deeply engaged in the life of that school. And the best way I can illustrate this is there was a pep rally early in, in the year. He had been there for a year as kind of the academic presence in, this, in the school and then took over as principal. So it was early in his second year of being in the school. And you had 2,500 kids for the first pep rally. And all of a sudden, from the stands, there's this shout, Benetti, Benetti, Benetti. You know, the principal comes out to take a bow. Well, I don't know about you, but if people were calling out the name of my principal, <laughs> the word before that I wouldn't want to repeat in mixed company. So this is pretty, this is pretty astonishing. And the, this process, the story reaches out beyond the confines of the individual schools to the knitting together of a system. Um, the image of a herd of cats comes, comes right out of education. And yet, if this, you know, what you'd have classically is a loose confederacy of schools, each going its own way. And you get pockets of excellence and lots of you know, lots of space between. Here there really is the sense that each of the schools is going to work on the same agenda. They're going to do it in different ways, different personalities, but they're heading in the same direction. And there are a whole bunch of administrative devices bringing principal and superintendent and top administrators together to talk about where have you been, what's going on now, where are you going? And they would do this twice a year and you'd have this conversation with some recommendations coming and some support being provided to the school to address, <coughs> excuse me, to address particular problems that it, that it had. Um, and, and finally, as I said, you have these connections to parents and the broader community. Now the, the mayor in Union City, Brian Stack, is one of the most powerful political leaders in North Jersey. Jersey has this really weird rule in which you can be a city official and a state lawmaker at the same time. So he is the mayor, um, Irish third generation. His Spanish consists of gracias and, and buenos dias, sort of pronounced worse than that, um, who gets 90 plus percent of the vote because he is the energizer bunny. He is the Mother Teresa meets Boss Daly kind of mayor. And in Sacramento, Pardon me, in wrong state, wrong home. In Trenton, that little in Trenton, um, he has made himself the best, best friend of whoever is sitting in the governor's mansion of whichever party, and that's enabled him to bring home the bacon. That high school that I'm describing was an $85 million state-of-the-art place in which almost any high school principal would walk in there with her tongue hanging out with envy, you know, with science labs that, you know, you would love to have here. And, um, you know, a theater department that could very well, you know, be a off-Broadway 
better than an off-Broadway stage, and a football field carved out of the middle of the school, from the roof of the school, just a little... So when I, this time around, when I was just back there, I did something that I hadn't gotten to do before. It was sort of I played out Friday Night Lights by running on that football field. It's quite an experience. It's the same turf that the, that the New York Giants have for their football field. So 75% um, of the people in the community, when polled, and, and the mayor does poll, say the school system is doing an excellent job. Um, I wouldn't want to try that poll out any place else. Um, I certainly would not want to try that poll out here in, in, uh, in Gotham. Um, when I finished working on Union City, understanding, immersing myself in Union City, and I say finished working on, but not finished sort of being connected to, because that isn't going to end, um, I thought, what are people going to say when they read this, you know, this story, which is inspiring or heart-rendering or whatever? They're going to say, that's nice, but, right? And they're going to list of buts. So I did a little bit of um, backward mapping. I put on my policy cap and I looked for school districts that, other school districts that had improved the achievement levels and narrowed the achievement gap more than you'd expect given the demographics. And I was looking at very big districts and medium-sized districts and small districts, predominantly Latino districts, predominantly African-American districts, mixed districts, districts that had a lot of money, like Union City or New York City, districts that had half as much money to spend, districts where the mayor appointed the board, districts where the board was elected, districts with powerful unions, weak unions. I tried to find all of the variables that you might think about and look to see what did they do? What, what explained, what strategy did they follow? And it var the strategy would vary in its particulars depending upon local needs and expectations as you'd anticipate. The curriculum was going to vary from place to place. Um, and what was possible depended a lot on money. You know, a full day of preschool for all three and four-year-olds. That's fabulous. It's also supported by, you know, a landmark state court decision in New Jersey. If you're in a place called Aldine, Texas, which I would bet nobody in this room has ever heard of, but Aldine, Texas, which is a suburb of Houston, has more students than Boston or Washington, D.C. Aldine, which is a great school district for its poor Latino and African-American population, has half as much money to spend, a little less than half, about $8,000 a kid. So that means they can provide preschool for the very poorest of four-year-olds. And you can imagine the kind of strain that produces inside the community and the superintendent you know, says, you know, these kids are, that's such a head start for them, such a leg up, that we almost want to create a separate class for them, but that's going to just, you know, exaggerate the problems that we've got. And, you know, Union City and schools here can afford some pretty fancy electives for students who are on their way, you know, up to the, you know, the top of the rung. School system like Aldine, Texas can afford maybe a couple of advanced placement um, classes. That's the trade-off. But which is only to say money enables you to do a lot more. Money is not the solution. See Camden, New Jersey, which spends more than Union City, but money can enable you to do a whole lot more uh, for kids, and the kids are going to benefit from that. Um, so overall, what these districts did, you know, can be described um, in the terms that management folks call continuous improvement. It's an old theory, a guy named Deming, who got no attention in the U.S., went to Japan, you know, became a hero in Japan, comes back to this country, continuous improvement. There's a great preschool curriculum called High Scope, um, very simple model, plan, do, review. The kids get together, figure out what they're going to do for the day. Then they go do it with some help from the teacher. Then they come back together again and figure out what worked, what didn't work, what they're going to do next. Well, all those districts are doing is plan, do, review for grown-ups. It's the same story. There's nothing very fancy about it. Um, but I, I want it's, it's, it's not fancy. It's not easy. But it's certainly worth doing because it can change the arc of children's lives, as it has 
in Union City and Montgomery County and Long Beach and Garden Grove and Houston and Aldine and a host of other places, Little Sanger, California, an even poorer farm town outside of Fresno. It's changed the lives of tens, hundreds of thousands of kids. And you know, when it works, it changes the arc of America's future. It's the answer, or an answer at least, to the challenge that Neil posed in his introduction. So thank you. Thank you, David. Um, so, a couple of things. First of all, the books, David's book is for sale in back. So, at the end of the session, if you want to buy one, they're discounted to $20 tonight. No credit cards, but I guess cash or check, right? Um, yeah. So, uh, and presumably David will stick around a little bit afterwards and maybe sign a few. I want to introduce the other two folks we have up in the front. Natalia Melman Petrozela is Assistant Professor of Education Studies and History at Eugene Lang College, which is the new school's undergraduate college. She's a former public school teacher here in New York City, and she has a book coming out very soon from the, from the same publisher as David. It's uh, titled Classroom Wars, Sex Language, and the Creation of American Political Culture. And it's Oxford University Press. Next to her is Clara Hemphill, who is the founder and uh, editor of InsideSchools.org, and she's a senior editor at the Center and has been working with us on public education research for several years now. Clara, oh, one thing I want to point out, City Council Member Gail Brewer is with us. Thank you for coming. Clara. Um, hi. Um, I, I enjoyed your book very much. Um, I, I, uh, one of the uh, metaphors I really loved was the, the Swiss watch. Mm -hmm. That you, it's not, you know, we've all seen movies about the hero teacher, you know, transforming the lives of kids, but um, when you spend a lot of time in schools, you realize it's every level. It's the teacher, it's the principal. And I was glad you gave a shout out to superintendents who don't get a lot of, you know, credit in this. Um, but the, the Swiss watch is very fragile, and, and I wonder, um, in Union City, whether there's a lot of the um, improvements that you talk about went um, under a very sympathetic um, head of education for the state. And I wonder now with um, uh, Chris Cerf whether you fear that some of the gains will be eroded. No, um, I think Union, Union City has become the poster child even for Governor Christie and for Chris Cerf. You know, and that's a problem as well as a plot, right? They'll say, this is a great school district. Why isn't every school district as good as this one? And part of the answer is that they have, those districts, many, many districts, want to do better than they're doing now. And one measure of that is the reaction to, I did a piece in the New York Times about Union City, and all of a sudden, the Union City Superintendent's Office was flooded with districts wanting to see what they're doing and to talk to them and learn from them. But it takes help. Union City had a very smart guy early on in the story who saw what needed to be done. When he left, he went to work for the state and was indeed helping other districts. Doing it yourself is, is tough. So on the one hand, you get the governor and the education commissioner talking about you know, why isn't every place like Union City? On the other hand, you get them talking about charters and vouchers. And, you know, to put it politely, it's a mixed message. And we're getting a mis mixed message from Washington, too. We are getting mixed messages from Washington. I'm, you know, I'm going to be there on Wednesday talking to some of the senior folks in the Department of Education. And um, the latest round of Race for the Top funds, these are the incentive grants, small in, in amount, huge in impact on the way in which districts have functioned. The latest round goes to districts that want to sort of build stronger systems. And the, to me, the most interesting response came from California, where 10 or 11 districts, which among them have as many students as New Jersey, said, we've been collaborating. This is what we're trying to do. We're developing a better, a better accountability system. We agree that what we have isn't good enough. 
We think the testing is much too narrow. We're developing a whole array of other supports. You know, help us in the work that we're doing. California, as you may know, spends maybe half as much as, as, as New York. So it's also, you know, the folks in Washington have not learned how to work and play well with others. As you may have noticed, they could go back to Celia Rojas's preschool class and, you know, might get something useful out of it. But, you know, until that happens, I've tended to be much more attentive to what's happening at the school district level and to some extent at the state level. I'm, I'll, I'll wait on Washington for a good while. Natalia, why don't you and I alternate questions? Yeah, that sounds like a nice playing well together strategy. <laughs> um, I also really liked the book and enjoyed your talk as well. I'm curious to know, you mentioned kind of in passing the role of unions and unions and unions in Union City that don't um, obstruct progress. And I'm curious to know because it sounds like so much of what teachers like Alina Bosbali does is above and beyond. What's the role of unions in Union City? Well, I think in Union City, the union, the teachers in Union City are well compensated. Mm -hmm. That helps a lot. Um, they have not been an active education force. But if I look elsewhere at a place like Montgomery County where the union was very contentious, or this little town of Sanger, California where relations were so terrible that there was a sign that hung in, as you came into the town, a sign that said, you know, new teachers beware, Sanger unfriendly to teachers. And in both cases, the turnaround came because the superintendents, and Sanger is small, Montgomery County is 17th largest school district in America, um, brought the union representatives in, not just at contract renewal time, mm -hmm. but to really talk about education policy. So that in Montgomery County, for example, they developed a system for teacher evaluation support and ultimately were appropriate firing mm -hmm. that everybody bought into. Um, and it put an equal number of teachers and principals at the table figuring out what strategies you could use to support the teacher, and a year or two later, if they weren't working, uh, whether it made sense for that teacher to look elsewhere for, mm -hmm. for work. And that's, that seems to have been the pattern. I mean, my general view is that, I mean, this conversation around education has gotten so ugly, but with very few exceptions, the people in the field want to help kids. They have different ideas of what to do. There are, there are some folks who want to make a fair amount of money, but there are not many of them, and most people do not go on education to, to make to make money, and this, you know, if you say to the union reps, there's going to be a ten there's going to be an inherent tension. You know, you want money, salary money, and we want to both husband our resources and, and do a variety of things. But we're all in it for the kids. At least in a couple of places, mm -hmm. this has worked, and it's going to have to work because the relationship between unions and school systems is changing. It's changing rapidly. Mm -hmm. You know, Randy Weingarten understands this. The NEA doesn't understand this as well. Mm -hmm. um, the question is whether the unions are going to lead the direction of that change so they really do become education partners. Mm -hmm. um, whether they're just going to get dissed by someone like Governor Christie who talked about the unions as drug mules. Uh, an awful image to describe a teacher as, as using the kids as, as drug mules. Um, and you know, I think the answer is going to depend on the way in which that relationship is set. And, and having you know, the opportunity to work with a new mayor, mm -hmm. you know, blank slate, yeah. lots of history on one side, really does mean that New York can, can begin rewriting the, mm -hmm. the, the book. Yeah. Um, I was struck by how tolerant you are of uh, patronage. Um, you, you said that uh, politics are imbued like uh, mother's milk, I think. And, you, you described uh, admiringly an eighth grade uh, math teacher who uh, worked in political campaigns in order to get promotions within the school system. Yeah, I think uh, when I spent, after a month of being in Union City, I was ready to quit because I thought this is just about politics. And I was living here and my partner would come up on weekends and said, you know, are you having a good time at the classroom in the school? I said, yeah. I said, well, just hang out, enjoy yourself, don't take it seriously. And I realized that I was going, I went through the process that any anthropologist goes through. Round one is you fall in love with the folks that you're with. Round two is you hate the folks, you get disillusioned and hate the folks you're with. And round three is you come to terms with what's happening. Now, I think it's fair to say about, it is fair to say about Union City, that there isn't a teacher or a principal 
younger than 55 who is where they are because of politics. That is, these are competent, able folks. And there are a lot of principals who were there without ever having any connection to politics. So all the new assistant principals in the high school had nothing to do with politics. If you look at the staff, if you look at the custodians, there are two or three classifications of custodian in the system. That's pretty rare, right? It tells you, you know, those jobs, you know, the jobs of the crossing guards, those jobs are essentially in the hands of the mayor. But what's happened of late is that you build this virtuous circle that operates. The mayor, the mayor genuinely cares about these kids. It's just very hard not to get that when you see him in a, a time and time again with families and with kids. He also gets a lot of political credit because the school district is doing well. The school district is doing well because it's got capable people in those jobs. There's not, I didn't run into anybody below the age of 55 who I would describe as a hack. Um, and those guys, are, those guys are leaving and it's not the Union City way to fire these guys. You know, they put up with them for a while. Now, I think, I think that as, as long as Brian is the mayor of Union City, they're fine. And Brian has this fantasy that he's going to be mayor for life. This is all he wants to do, and this is all he does do. But he's, he's going to wear himself out. And who knows whether the next mayor, with similar powers to pick a school board, what direction that mayor would take the school system in. So it's a, it's a mayoral control works really well right now. It has produced huge stability, which is a key factor in the story. There have been two superintendents since 1989 which has meant it's impossible to do, to follow a, a path consistently over a period of time. But it's neither the panacea, nor is it the sort of disaster zone. You know, a lot depends on sort of where you stand in that, uh, in that story. So, so the sort of short version of this is that politics turns out to be a whole lot more complicated a tale than you might, you know, otherwise imagine. One other factor, the fact that you've got a, a powerful mayor and state lawmaker who's also very much a friend of the schools and draws in the schools for support means you've got this amazing high school, this amazing preschool, a new elementary school, a new middle school, a new freshman academy. That's a lot of new schools to be able to bring in and a lot of new resources to do things like offers. They do three years of Mandarin in the high school. Just imagine those kids are going to graduate trilingual. So it's a, it's a complicated tale. I d One last comment. There isn't a school district in America that is not politically riven. Mm -hmm. So the question is, which style of politics you know, are you going to like? It can be bureaucratic politics, you know, play the principal teacher game politics, school board politics. For now, in Union City, this is a pretty benign system of politics. So I'm curious, a lot of people, it sounds like our, can you, is this, okay. I've, a lot of people are already asking, how can we replicate some of Union City's successes? And I'm curious specifically what you think the role of schools of education might be in that, because it sounds like there's some real unsung heroes in here, which are these small regional colleges, but how can, you know, more influential players get involved with um, influencing in this positive way that you've seen? So I, I'm, you know, it's interesting, when I ask the teachers, you know, who, how did you learn how to teach? Mm -hmm. None of them mentioned teachers' colleges. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> they mentioned each other. That's how they learned. Interesting. They were all scared rabbits mm -hmm. year one. I heard a lot about, you know, sitting at your desk and crying at lunchtime or wanting to quit after the first month or the first semester that they were there. So there's a whole long conversation not for tonight, right. about how you'd reform uh, teachers' colleges. I would start by mostly closing the buildings and moving them out into the schools. Um, I, said, I was asked at one point, did I, was I interested in being the dean of the Harvard Education School? I said, you'd never want me, I, why? And when I said something like that, you know, you really have got to be spending a lot more time in the field, right. they said, you're right, we wouldn't want you. That was the end of that. Was the end of that. <laughs> Um, I, I get a little defensive when you attack uh, New York City. Um, you know, we think some of our schools are really good here, and we have. I'm sure they are. Yeah, and we have. I mean, we have 32 districts, each of which is probably two or three times the size of Union City, um, and some of those districts have actually done a lot of what you describe. Mm -hmm. 
that they have a coherent curriculum from K to 12 and that they um, invest in uh, staff development and um, the, the, the problem is getting more than one district working. Um, and I wonder how you go from one district to 32 or one, or one district to many districts. So this is the, this is the, Gold, this is the, the Steinberg cartoon problem. New York is, I have no idea. New York is sui generis. Yeah. You know, if I can say something that's useful in Milwaukee and Cleveland and Kansas City and St. Louis and in other districts in New York that are doing well, I'm really happy. But I don't know if you can actually operate a system as complicated as this one, as a single system. Los Angeles has the same kinds of problems. And I've no doubt that there are great schools in New York, and I'm delighted that there are great districts in New York. I look at the overall graduation rates, I look at the racial and ethnic gaps, and I'm horrified. This is a richer population. The Latino population here is richer than, than it is in Union City. There's no reason why the overall graduation rate should be 40 points lower. So overall, I'm not happy with what's happening here. But I wouldn't begin to be, you know, the Mr. Fix-It of this system, except to say, maybe it's time once again to rethink whether or not it makes sense, whether this is a too big to, to succeed school district. Now, you guys would know that a whole lot better, better than I. And, you know, essentially what I can say is, I, the district wants to talk about, you know, what to do. You know, they can, I can talk about Aldine, or I can talk about Montgomery County, or I can talk about Long Beach, all of which are bigger than the districts that you're describing, all of which have done very well. Uh, you talk about New York as a whole, you guys are going to have to come up with, uh, with the answer <laughs> to that one. I'm curious about curriculum a bit. I was really struck and impressed in the context of what exists in many places today that Spanish is used extensively as a language of instruction. Also, it seems that there's this cultural piece, which is not just about cultural celebration of the nations of origin, but also the latkes with the salsa and the mandarin. And I'm wondering where that comes from. Is this, it sounds like it's more than just a prag uh, pragmatic approach to what works, but there is, does seem to be a kind of cultural philosophy. And I'm wondering what that is and how that plays into the big picture there. You know, I, I think it's a very pragmatic place. Mm -hmm. I think the preschool folks went looking around for curriculum units that they thought worked. And this was, the, the Latka unit was a great couple of days. And so they went with it. And, you know, the fact that it is Latkas in Union City makes it a charming story. You know, this is, I'll tell you, this is surely not a political correctness story, not a concept right. that exists in, in that corner of the world. But generally, when you talk to the teachers about what books did you pick, because there is a set curriculum with lots of supplements. And the third grade teachers would be picking one set of books because that's the way they operated. They all talked about great compelling stories that they could connect to their kids and that spoke to character. So again, there is no such thing as character education in Union City, but you get character development from the very beginning in that preschool class. Um, there's a great lesson a great science lesson involving what kids can learn when they were looking at various bugs through a microscope. I mean, these kids extracted amazing amounts of information and nudged by their teacher, mm -hmm. there was more to be seen. And then she was off with some other group and the kids are fighting who's gonna get to the microscope. And she comes back and she says what teachers of four-year-olds always say, use your words. And then she says something more interesting is what can we do? Mm -hmm. uh, what can I do? What mm -hmm. can we do to fix this? Right, that's the pie, that's all that part of the right. story. So I think everything fits in to a larger sense of connectedness. This is a town which used to be so Cuban dominated. <coughs> um, it was uh, more Cubans than any place else in the country than Miami. It was known as Havana on the Hudson. So most of the Cubans moved out. Uh, they own many businesses in town. They moved to the suburbs. The folks who live there now are a lot poorer a lot less educated. They come from every place from Mexico to Chile, a lot from, the, from DR in Puerto Rico, Mexico, Ecuador. There's no one dominant group. And you can imagine lots of cultural tensions. And in fact, there's huge efforts at the community level to do the many in the one, so that you'd have lots of separate events that other folks would feel comfortable participating in, and one sort of overarching event that people would engage in. And that filters into the 
into the schools as well. It's very much the many and, and the one as, mm -hmm. as part of what Union City is about. Great. One of the things I was struck by um, was how fragile the gains seem to be. That there'd be you know, good test scores one year and then a slip the next, or uh, a good principal would leave or a good teacher would leave. Um, and, and it was a lot of two steps forward and one step back. And that you said that um, a lot of the gains are based on 12-hour days and six-day weeks, which are not sustainable. Well, if you're a teacher here, you will teach two sections of a class at the same time. And you're the same person. One section is great, and one section you're pulling your hair out. And you don't start out different, although, but you wind up being different along the way. Something about that classroom constitution exists. I, I would say Union City is a five steps forward, one step back mm -hmm. place. Um, and I can't think of an example in which a good leader was replaced by a bad leader. I can think of examples in which a bad you know, principal was replaced by good principals. So I really do think, but the, the, the takeaway that I want to grab from your comments is that you cannot ever assume that you're done. Yeah. You cannot ever assume that the problems are over. So that in the high school, for example, I mean, it's, it's time to celebrate when a school has a 90% graduation rate. But most of those kids are graduating barely proficient. And one of the secrets of these high school leaving exams is that basically being proficient on that exam means you've past ninth grade, what would be ninth grade education. And so these Same kids, here. many of Same here, at yeah. the Regents exams in yeah. New York. Yeah. Many of these, yeah, I was, having taken them, I always wondered why people thought they were such the gold standard. I mean, you know, in any event, yeah. that's another, yeah. another story. I went back, they're all online. I went back and looked at the Regents exams that I took and I thought, hmm, pretty weak. Um, uh -huh. At any event. Um, so they graduate, they'll go to community college, many of those folks who just skated through. They're not going to be ready for college. They'll take remedial courses. They'll drop out. And only now, this high school was a terrible, these are terrible high schools until very recently. That's the last step in this process. And it's not as though the school system doesn't recognize this. They're aiming for that point two, three, four years down the road in which every kid is taking the PSAT and the SAT exams. So forget the state standard. Every kid should be taking the preliminary SAT exam. And that should be a benchmark of how it is that they're doing. But they know they've got a ways to go. You have teachers who are there who think it's great that their kids got a high school diploma given the background that they had. There are kids, they made it, that's fine. They're gonna go to community college, that's great. And getting those teachers to appreciate that they need to up their game and they need to have higher aspirations for their kids than their teachers had for them is happening. Amazingly, it's happening. Um, and there are no miracle workers in the system. So, you know, a, a natural follow-on question would be, oh, it's a Superman story, it's a charismatic leader story. These are guys, in, in a couple of cases, these are men who are, who are in the system, right, have grown up in the system. The woman who is the academic heart of the district you know, has been there all her life. The superintendent has been there all his life. The principal in the high school has been there all his life. Yeah. They get, they learn bit by bit by bit from being teacher to assistant principal to a place in the central office to, to what have you. Um, and it's not a process that ever ends. We could take any of the school districts that I was mentioning and we could figure out what wasn't done, what remained undone. That's not a knock. That's reality. It never, it never ends. And I don't care where you are. You know, if you're running the best KIPP school in the country or you're running the best prep school in the country, if you think it's done, you're, you should be out the door. You know, you're just missing something very important. The that's the nature of the, of the enterprise. That's why the market model is so inappropriate. I mean, you know, computers don't talk back. You know, except when you want them to, right? Um, they're not, you know, changing people, moving people down a course through the help of other people, which is what schools are about, is an inherently fraught, uncertain, complicated, and contingent enterprise. And so you're not really surprised, are you, that it would be, there would be steps forward and steps back in that, in that, 
in that story, I, I suspect. But it's, it's important to remember that is the takeaway lesson, that yeah, there are going to be problems that exist. That elementary school never made it finally over the hump yet. No. But it will. They're getting better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've got, a, they've got a tough road to hoe. I mean, there you've got 75% of the kids in that school are, quote, at-risk kids. At-risk is an educator's euphemism for meaning likely to drop out or flunk out. You know, the, the stories that these kids would tell me are hair-raising stories, and that they take them matter-of-factly. Mm -hmm. So at some level, it's a miracle that they show up in school, let alone that they shine as you know, enthusiastic children, let alone that they can sit for exams where everything the teacher has tried to build up during the course of the school year, the students work all over the art stuff, the kind of kibitzing beforehand, the group, all gone, right? The room looks like a prison cell. Everything has been papered over. You know, if a kid talks to another kid, you know, they're gone. If the teacher sees it and doesn't do anything, she's gone. It's amazing that in that kind of environment, these kids do as well as they do. I'm curious, you mentioned earlier in your remarks that despite these great differences across the divide and these educational debates, there is this shared desire to help kids. And I'm wondering, you mentioned, you know, there are no TFA teachers in Union City, and I think there's a very compelling alternative model of an excellent teacher. Is there a place for something like TFA or that model in a place like <coughs> Union City or otherwise? Well, Union City has a very stable teaching core, and in that it's quite mm -hmm. unusual. But I think, you know, this is one of those success builds on success, and because folks come from there, mm -hmm. they stay there. In that kind of a place, in the school that I was in, a Teach for America teacher would be a distraction. He or she doesn't know the community, doesn't know the culture of the school, and isn't likely to stay. Mm -hmm. So in all those ways, that teacher is going gonna, is gonna to interfere with the education mission of the school. Mm -hmm. This is not a knock on TFA. You know, I can imagine lots of circumstances in which it's, it's valuable to a school, and I can certainly imagine circumstances in which for someone who's thinking about teaching that as a way to start in, the, in that profession, it's a good thing to be about doing. But in the end of the day, TFA is like charter schools. You know, it's a, it's a drop of sand in the desert. Mm -hmm. You've got to grow your own. And that's as true in, you know, in an inner city African American or poor white or Latino community as it is any place else. Mm -hmm. um, You've got to work with folks because those are the folks who will come back to you and who know the place and who want to give back. I mean, give back was a refrain that I heard so many times, our kids, so many times. Mm -hmm that, you know, they weren't all reading from master script. This is exactly how they felt about themselves. I was really impressed by the um, pre-K, the two years of, of uh, pre-kindergarten. And that's mm -hmm. one thing that um, it, when our mayor tried to fix things, he started with the high schools and um, spent huge amounts of time and money and energy trying to fix the high schools while the eighth grade NAEP were flat for a decade. Um, if, if you don't have the money for two years of nursery school, which is unusual, mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think is important there? One year of preschool. Yeah. Um, if you don't have the money for one year of full day preschool, you have the money for a year of half day preschool, which is what, if you don't have the money for a half day preschool for everybody, you're in you know, this dirt poor place in Texas where they're spending $7,800 a year, you provide it for the neediest kids. Um, but it's, you know, I, I, I ask this question jokingly. Why not get rid of, instead of talking about preschool and can we afford it, why not talk about why do we have 12th grade? I mean, if there wasn't football, there wouldn't be 12th grade in school. Would there, I mean, what goes on there? You either want to get to college and you're bored to tears, or you want to get a job and you're bored to tears, you know, or you want to hang out with your buddies. Think back, folks, to what life was like, you know, in, in 12th grade. Not much happened. But we don't think that way. We think of, we think of preschool as this sort of add-on, this luxury item. And in that, as in many other things that Neil mentioned earlier on, we're way behind the eight ball in terms of what other places are, are doing. And it's not just preschool, right? It's quality, and quality itself is another one of those words, high quality preschool, so easy to say, 
so hard to do. And in Union City, what makes this interesting is they did not have you know, classroom space for all public preschools. Two thirds of those kids are attending places that were babysitting centers before the court decision said, you've got to really up your game. And what Union said, one of the most remarkable things they did was to build a system out of those 35, you know, private for profit, not for profit, church run, city run places. And they are well on their way to a world in which if you walk into the classroom and observe what's going on and just watch the kid interaction with each other and with the teacher, you don't know what the sign on the door says. Mm -hmm. You know, does it say the Bida Wee Child Care Center or, you know, St. Matthew's Episcopal, you know, Center or, you know, Hostess, you know, public school program. That's crucial. And I would hope that is one thing that I would say, you know, is a central citywide and you're really pointing in that direction that you've got to build from the bottom up in a whole bunch of ways. As I said, the best education, the best education goes on is great preschool education. And it requires that you know a fair amount about child development to be able to pull it off. Um, what Union City did was to realize that and to take that model of education up the grade level. So in many schools now, Kindergarten has become the new first grade because everybody's afraid of the no child left behind third grade test and everything gets pushed down. They turn the story on its head. They sent the master teachers from preschool into the kindergarten classrooms, work with the kindergarten teachers to get them to revamp their classrooms. And the kindergarten teachers, many of whom were reluctant, some of whom, as I mentioned in the book, went to the union, which said, nothing doing. We think this is a fine idea. Just, you know, don't worry about what the, what the rule book says at this, at this moment. Um, what pushed the kindergarten teachers ultimately were the kids. You know, they'd been used to working on projects hands-on, talking with each other, solving problems, moving from group to group, sit in a row and tell them to basically, you know, behave like parrots, they're going to rebel. So the kindergarten teacher said, what are you, fomenting little revolutionaries back there? And then came to realize <laughs> that no, what they were doing was fomenting little, little you know, learners. And the kindergarten classes are a whole lot more alive than they were. And that process has, has worked its way up the system as well. I'm curious if you could say more about um, the role of parents. I was just blown away by the image you mentioned in your talk and in the book of the kind of packed parents' night. I mean, you know, that just doesn't happen in most places. So, like, can you say more? They don't just show up. What is the investment they have? How do they make it a priority? I will, but I think this, just looking at my, what to, might be yeah, a good time to open, open up, the, up. Yeah. the conversation to folks, yeah. to, <laughs> folks, to folks generally uh, who've been sitting here okay. patiently. Um, I think that's a good idea. Um, but, yeah. I mean, again, this is not something that happened overnight. Yeah. This is when you have people from the community working in the schools who are working for you, who you know over the years and who you trust, mm -hmm. you're going to connect to the schools. Mm -hmm. And I think in this case, it is an advantage that you've got immigrant parents who came to this country to make a decent living and to give their kids a new start. Mm -hmm. And you know, they have the unalloyed vision of the American dream. Absolutely. They haven't been disappointed by the failures of the public schools to do well by them or you know, other members of their family. Mm -hmm. So when they realize that the schools will do for them and that they want them, they want the parents, the schools want the parents mm -hmm. to contribute, it's really an exciting thing for them to see going on. You also, you, you know, teachers are scared to death of parents, by and large. This is where preschool teachers can say something useful. The farther up the ladder you go, because parents are often seen as troublemakers who show up in the school and, oh my God, you know, it's not parents' night, go away, I'll see you in, you know, next term. Um, but these are parents that are, and there are parents, there are pain in the neck parents in Union City as there are any place else. But they get it. This is part of that respect story. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, a word like respect or trust, so easy to say, so hard to do. This is a slow but steady wins mm -hmm. the race. So, you know, when people say, okay, these are the seven rules that you've got to follow when I see this on websites, I'm like, oh my God, it's exactly not right. what I'm trying to say. It's hard, it's hard work, but we know how to do it. That's the Good. guts of the message. Do you, do you have a microphone that you're yeah, running around? Uh, I'd like to know uh, what Union City is going to be doing to try to improve the high school. Well, you mentioned in your book that less than half, half a percent of the students uh, are above proficient. 
And two, how are you going to attract students when they go to college? Because college readiness really is kind of a key. It goes well at any level. No, that's exactly. And that is, I was Did everybody hear that question? I, I don't know. If I, I, I didn't hear it on the mic. It was how many... Um, What's the high school going to do to improve? Is the guts of the... How do you improve the high school? Yeah. The high school? Well, when I was in Union City the other night giving a talk to a sort of packed auditorium, it was kind of a celebration event, you know, I said, look, this high school is doing better than any urban, urban non-selective high school in the country. Find me another urban high school that has, 100%, uh, has a 90% graduation rate. And I said, for just the reasons you're suggesting, that is not enough, and they know that's not enough. This is where the higher expectations for teachers comes in. This is where the, we're going to expect that students, every student take the PSAT exam in junior year and the SAT exam in senior year comes in. If they do that, who cares about the state exams? I and mean, the state exams are, you know, are a piffle compared to what, those, what that's about. And that is changing. So the number of kids in AP classes has grown substantially and is continuing to grow. The number of kids in honors classes has grown. This is a long process. But if you looked at those high schools, you know, 10 years ago, a dozen years ago, you had a 65% graduation rate. You know, I, I think it's appropriate f to celebrate the accomplishment, and they get, just as you do and I do, they're not done. They know they're not done. Um, and what's remarkable is in a 2,400, 2,500 student school, I didn't run into a teacher who thought, we're doing great, or that's all these kids can do. That was not the response that people had. I mean, there really has been a culture evolution, and now in his third year in the, in the school, a culture shift brought about not by some outside miracle maker, but by somebody who, just as a very smart guy, baked into that system. Is this an Abbott school district? Yes, it's an Abbott school, sure. That's, why the, that's where the two years of preschool funding uh, comes from. Okay, there. Hi, good evening, Devon folks. Um, my question is, uh, was technology present in the Union City uh, classroom? And if so, what role did it play and how was it utilized? In the, in the mid-1990s, once Union City's elementary schools and middle schools were on the way up, a, one of the phone companies offered to run an experiment in a school district. It would hand out laptops to every kid in one middle school and not on another middle school, and all the teachers. Union City jumped. You know, they were, at this point, they felt like they had, they were over the hump enough so they could jump. Mid-1990s, this was a real rarity, and that experiment was very successful in those two schools, so successful that Bill Clinton showed up to celebrate Union City. Nobody had ever celebrated Union City before. So in that sense, technology was this huge boost. I mean, from then till now, you know, you've got, of course, you've got computers in every classroom. You've got a lot of kids using iPads. You've got smart boards for teachers who, you know, can write and store stuff that's there. That data system is very technologically driven. It helps a lot. But if it didn't exist, I don't think, the, I think the difference would be marginal. Um, people love using it. Teachers don't have to hand write their little lesson, their lesson plans. They can actually you know, enter them to a computer and they're there. That's great. Um, but the essence of the place, technology becomes a useful complement to a system that's already in place. Uh, here. Um, thank you. Hi. Um, you keep talking about how this is a slow and steady process, except we don't live in a world that is tolerant of slow and steady. Uh, we've had, you know, tremendous gains here in New York, and yet it's never enough. We have uh, from 50% to now a 65% graduation rate, but yet college readiness is, you know, like 20-something percent. So how do you get politicians who have to run for re-election every two years or four years to buy into slow but steady. Um, and what indicators along the way are you looking at so that you can say we're on the right track, 
even though it's slow and steady, you don't, you know, when do you know that you're not making progress? Well, that's a, it's a great question because we live in so many ways in an impatient age. The same thing is true of research. We'd love to know something about the long-term effects of interventions with kids, but now two years looks like long-term to the folks who are funding research. I mean, the, the phenomenon you describe is, you know, can be generalized to look like this. A school board fires the person who's there and hires the person who promises to turn things around totally and quickly with a new miracle cure. That person shows up, two years, two and a half years goes by, there's no miracle, there's a new school board election, insurgents run, they want to throw out the superintendent, they do, a new superintendent comes in, you know, in big cities the average superintendent lasts less than three years. You, one thing we know is with that kind of churn, you cannot make progress in that kind of a system. We know this as well, if you're a teacher or a principal, in that world, the only thing, the only intelligent thing to do is to wait them out because you know that whatever, you, you know, you move in this direction today, you're going to be pushed in that direction tomorrow. In the places, so it's a, it's a serious endemic problem and if we cannot figure out a way of getting past it, there is no good answer to that. So what I, I'll point to Montgomery County as a one, as a hopeful story. Montgomery County, very rich and very poor, very interesting two worlds county, and as I said, 16th biggest school district in the country. They went through this eating up of superintendents process for years. And they bring in a guy, he looks at the wall, you know, sees all his predecessors, you know, that one lasted three years, that one lasted two years, what do I do? Um, and he said, I, we need to redistribute money from the rich schools to the poor schools, he actually calls them the green zone and the red zone schools, and what I promise is that we will improve achievement for at all levels and we will narrow the achievement gap. And how did he do that? He worked from the bottom, as we've been talking. He also worked from the top because what he discovered was there weren't very many AP classes. AP classes were the low-hanging fruit for the administration. You could introduce those classes. Kids loved them. They were doing better. More kids going to college, et cetera even as you're working from the bottom, and including AP classes there as well. So what happens is test scores improve, the gap narrows. The school board takes a little breath, says, okay, and we're gonna go find a little more money from you from the county. And they have a very complicated funding system there. County says, okay, we're gonna give you a little more money. Next year, you know, test scores continue to improve a little bit, gap narrows. You look at these school districts, over, and that's a place where you've got a very contentious political system, very articulated, very factionalized system, very strong union system. But what sets in over some period of time in a place like that is this virtuous circle. The politicians give more autonomy to the school folks. The school folks do better. The politicians can bask in the reflected glory. They can give the school folks more autonomy, et cetera. That's very hard for all the reasons that you suggest. And it's probably, the, of all the problems, it's the one that is most likely to impede reform in most places that I, that I know of. Um, it's very hard for politicians to sell patience. Um, steady progress? I don't know. I think you know voters and parents are probably smarter than most politicians give them credit for being. Yeah, Billy. Uh, so, David, you uh, 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 demurred to to say what what uh, to provide advice for New York City, but uh, nonetheless, it, it may appear too too large to succeed. But you know, we'll have a new mayor uh, elected this year, and they'll have the task of running the school system. And if this front row were filled with mayoral candidates, which we might have enough seats to fit all of them here, um, you know, and, and you had to say, here are some things that you should do uh, uh, as mayor to improve the New York City schools, what would you say? I would say you need a New Yorker up here to answer that question for you. <laughs> You've heard my answer to that question. In, in various forms. 
If there were, look, this is like, you know, if there were an easy answer to the question, somebody would have come up with it. I think you can extract lessons from the Union City story. You can build strong neighborhood-based schools. You can build a solid curriculum that will work for many students. Not all students, because, you know, this Union City is a simpler, by many, many leagues, place than, than New York. Um, but it's, you know, if I want folks to walk away with a handful of message, a handful of words to hold on to, it's patience and trust. I mean, my sense is that this is a city in which trust is in fairly short supply on all sides of the question. And this is where if I'm a new mayor, I'm going to basically say, I want to wipe that slate clean. It's like good teachers. The good teacher does not look to see what the predecessor teacher said about Billy Easton. Oh, he was a pain in the neck. You better watch out for him. You know, so now I'm all primed to watch out for Billy Easton when he shows up in my third grade class. Good teachers don't want to know. They want, they want you to start all over again, see what that relationship looks like. Um, you know, Michelle Rhee, my least favorite educator in the planet, um, was in negotiations with um, Randy Weingarten, who'd stepped into the local negotiations. And they were talking about a big salary increase. And Randy put out a number that was not hugely bigger. This is negotiations. That's what it's called. And Michelle Rhee said, are you on crack? <laughs> now, that is not a negotiating strategy that I've ever heard of. <laughs> it's likely to succeed. So, you know, the other version of the answer is you want the anti-Michelle anti Rhee. You want somebody who's going to be a good listener, who's going to believe that folks have the interest of kids at heart, and who's going to call people when they play adult games. And the unions and the school boards and the politicians and the, you know, there isn't a, there aren't folks at the community organizers. They're all at some level playing adult games. They ought to be called on it. They also all care about the kids. That's why they're there. So figuring out a way to get through all the junk, all the detritus that's built up over the years, you know, is, is really important. So you're going to have a, you're going to have a very, whoever the mayor is, she or he is going to be very different in style. Um, and there is an opportunity to open up those, you know, those conversations again. All right. Um, and there's no shortage of people in this room who are hoping to tell that next mayor how to do their job. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really want to thank Clara and Natalia and especially David for doing this Thanks. today. Thanks.